Okay, this is from Kanishka. Glenn, as you were writing A New American Dilemma and bringing up your perceived social pathologies in the Black community to civil rights icons, did a part of you ever recognize those pathologies in yourself? Were you self-reflective enough at the time to realize the irony of calling out these behaviors while also being a philanderer with a son you had not met? Ouch. Okay, I should explain a new American, I should explain just a new American dilemma published in December 1984 in the New Republic was my coming out article as a black conservative social critic. And I did what the questionnaire says I did in that piece, which was call out uh, social pathologies in the Black community. The year was 1984. I was philandering, as I discuss in the book, and I had yet to develop a relationship with my wonderful son, Alden Lowry, a journalist in Chicago, with whom I have a great relationship, him and his uh, three daughters, my grandchildren, uh, and so on. And I talk about that in the book. But At the time, in 1984, I was living something of a double life. I was, as I say in the book, on the other side of the line of respectability and decency and much of my uh, personal conduct. And I talk in the book about the fact that there was a disjunction between my personal behavior and the prescription that I had for Black America. And I even discuss being reprimanded uh, by the late and uh, distinguished uh, theologian and public intellectual uh, Father Richard John Newhouse, uh, he was not a father, he was Pastor Newhouse at the time, uh, where uh, I said to him, in effect, after some of my peccadilloes had become public, I said, look, I never said that I was a saint. Uh, My uh, prescription for social health for the African-American community might be inconsistent with my personal behavior, but whoever... uh, uh, argued that uh, you had to be a saint. I said to him, Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't a saint, and yet no one is saying that we shouldn't respect his moral leadership for that reason. And Newhouse really took me to task. He became angry. He slapped the table with his bare hand. He said to me, don't you ever say that? You hypocrite. You think you can be a moral leader and uh, not live decently yourself? You you discredit the entire enterprise of trying to exhort Uh, society to uh, a better way of life by uh, showing contempt for that uh, advice in your own personal life. And I think in retrospect that he was right. So my answer to the question is, yeah, I did entertain the possibility of some disjunction between my personal life and my prescription for Black America. But at the time, I didn't have the wisdom and uh, the self-critical Uh, posture to be able to take it to its logical conclusion, which I do as I develop the uh, account in my book. Isn't it that um, if you're in that kind of position, you sense yourself as an individual, I'm doing this, but my complaint is that a disproportionate number of people in a community do it as opposed to whether or not I'm doing it with my, you know, my one eccentric. So I can imagine feeling that way. You know, Newt Gingrich, whatever he was doing, he's sleeping with somebody while his wife's in the hospital or something like that. Or Jesse Jackson, you know, he has a love child while he's ministering to the Clintons during the Lewinsky scene. Well, it seems so common. And I always felt, well, it must feel like you're doing it because you're just yourself. But it's different when you're talking about a whole subculture-wide kind of behavior. Why does it have to be so common? That's that's how I think I would deal with it if I were in that situation. I don't know. Well, yeah, that is the that is the refuge of scoundrels in that situation that you can persuade yourself that I can just keep doing what I want to do irregardless, uh, but the rules apply to other people as a general matter. Uh, and I'm right about the fact that the rules apply to other people. Uh, and uh, I'll deal with my own uh, failings, uh, you know, when I meet my maker or whatever it might be, you can try to draw that line. But as Richard was insistent, I mean, he said, King's infidelities hurt the movement. Uh, they were wrong. Uh, and uh, the fact that he's a great man doesn't cancel out the fact that he was wrong. He would have been a greater man had he not uh, succumbed to those temptations. And at the end of the day, do you believe, the day, I do think you believe- 
Do you believe that that last point? Because I don't get it. I don't I don't see how the two things were related, especially given that mores were a little bit different in King's day, although he was something of an extreme. But for example, every single jazz musician, every single R and B musician has has had back in the day an unofficial idea that what goes on on the road is different than what goes on at home. King was just one more of them. I don't see what that has to do with with civil rights. I would. Uh, I'm just wondering: is that really what what you well, think? Well, yeah, I, I think I accept that he's talking to the nation about non discrimination and equal rights for Black Americans. On the one hand, he doesn't have to be a saint in his personal life to do that. He is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, the moral ground on which he stands depends in part upon um, what we think. Uh, that represents, and I, I mean, you know, I can make an argument uh, for separation. I did make the argument, but I don't think it stands up to scrutiny uh, at the end of the day. I, I think it, it's it's got a stench of self uh, justification about it that that uh, troubles me. So, mm. uh, I guess I can kind of afford to say that now, since I'm on the other side of all of that stuff. <laughs> 